In March 1938, Hitler decided to visit Austria in the few days following the Anschluss, or the forcible union between the two countries. Hitler had decided to drive over the border into his homeland and visit his birthplace in Braunau am Inn, as well as Linz and the Austrian capital Vienna. Security for the trip was provided by two agencies. SS Standartenführer Johann Rattenhuber's RSD, which was the Reichssicherheitsdienst, a special SS security unit of hand-picked bodyguards who worked closely with Hitler and the other leaders, and SS Sturmbannführer Bruno Gescher's SS Begleitkommando. The Begleitkommando was an SS bodyguard unit providing wider security around Hitler. They shared responsibility with the RSD, creating some jurisdictional confusion. Rattenhuber was in overall command, while Gescher acted as his deputy. In total, 31 bodyguards accompanied Hitler's cavalcade of vehicles as it progressed into Austria, with 10 acting as drivers under Hitler's personal driver, Erich Kempke. Members of both units wore identical grey SS uniforms to confound assassins. The bodyguards were divided into three details under Gescher, Obersturmführer Högel, the RSD deputy commander, and Hauptsturmführer Schädler, of the SS Begleitkommando. In all, there were twelve large Mercedes in the convoy, each car armoured. Five cars were required just to carry the bodyguards, weapons and luggage, plus more cars for Hitler and his entourage, a group that included his valet, Heinz Linger, adjutants Schaub and Brückner, Press Chief Dr. Otto Dietrich, the ever-present Martin Bormann, his personal secretary, Hitler's personal physician Dr. Karl Brandt, Heinrich Hoffmann, Hitler's court photographer, and Colonel General Wilhelm Keitel, chief of the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht. The bodyguard detachment on the visit to Hitler's birthplace was well armed. Between them they carried 14 MP38 machine pistols, and every man also carried two automatic pistols. Hitler's personal adjutant, SS Sturmbannführer Wernicke, was given two extra machine pistols with two full magazines each, just to be safe. The party drove from Munich after flying in from Berlin on the 12th of March 1938 aboard nine Junkers Ju-52s of the Führer's personal squadron. After boarding their cars, the first stop was Mühldorf, headquarters of Colonel General Feder von Bock's 8th Army. Army and Waffen-SS troops sealed off the HQ from prying eyes. At Braunau, the small border town where Hitler was born in 1889, he was met, as he was everywhere in Austria, by huge and enthusiastic crowds of admirers who showered his car with flowers while he stood and gave them his trademark German greeting from the passenger seat or reached down to shake upstretched hands. It was at moments like these that Hitler was most vulnerable to assassination, a fact that the RSD and the SS Begleitkommando were more than apprehensive about. But it proved extremely difficult to keep the adoring crowds back from Hitler's person, particularly when moving in a vehicle convoy where it was often impossible to cordon off roads. After passing through Lambach and Wels, the party arrived at the city of Linz, where Hitler's father had once been employed as a customs officer. There, the Führer and his entourage spent the night. On the 13th of March, Hitler resumed his triumphal progress towards Vienna. As the caravan of vehicles passed a petrol station, one man stood beside his car, his eyes narrowed with barely concealed loathing. Colonel Noel Mason McFarlane was the British military attaché in Vienna. He would later volunteer to assassinate Hitler once he was transferred to Berlin just before the German invasion of Poland, proposing to a horrified foreign office in London to shoot Hitler with a high-velocity rifle from a window in the British Embassy when he was reviewing an annual military parade. Mason McFarlane watched as two large Mercedes, quote, filled with SS bristling with Tommy guns and other lethal weapons came by. They were closely followed by half a dozen supercars containing Hitler and his entourage and bodyguard. End quote. The day ended with a large military parade in Vienna. 
Regardless of how many bodyguards that he had with him, Hitler still remained vulnerable when travelling by car. The best way to protect him when he was on the move, whether by plane, train or automobile, was to maintain secrecy about the route he would take, denying his enemies the vital time needed to plan an effective ambush. Hitler's vulnerability was startlingly clear when he drove into Austria. The Wehrmacht had only secured the towns that he visited a couple of days previously, and although enraptured crowds mostly greeted him in his homeland, there were those who would have liked him dead. The cordoning off of the streets through which Hitler's procession would pass was often inadequate and haphazard, the task falling mainly to rear echelon army signals detachments. This meant that people could get very close to Hitler and the party's vehicles, close enough that on several occasions they almost stopped the procession by sheer weight of numbers, requiring RSD bodyguards to walk beside Hitler's car, three on each side, to try to create a little space between the Führer and his adoring throngs. People would hand Hitler bunches of flowers or baskets of fruit as he stood in the front passenger seat, one hand gripping the windscreen frame, and any of these objects could have concealed a bomb. From a security point of view, it was a disaster waiting to happen. The situation got worse once Hitler started annexing countries that outright objected to German occupation. When he swallowed the remaining parts of Czechoslovakia in 1939, he boldly drove through Prague, where he was greeted not by saluting, yelling and crying throngs, but by small crowds who stood staring at their new master in ominous stony silence. Hitler sat for most of the time, only standing to salute German army units, but his car was still open-topped, an inviting target for any Czech nationalists. In the event, no one attempted to kill him. Once again, the entire party of Nazi bigwigs travelled in dark, open-top Mercedes, Hitler apparently as adamant as John F. Kennedy 24 years later that he should be clearly seen by both his admirers and his enemies. The Führer's party travelled in two groups. The first group consisted of Hitler's car, followed by two SS Big Light Commando bodyguard cars, another car full of aides and adjutants, and Colonel General Keitel and his adjutants. Hitler's immediate companions were his driver, Kempke, Adjutant Schaub, Hitler's chief military aide, Colonel Rudolf Schmundt, Captain Nikolaus von Belau, his Wehrmacht adjutant, Captain Engel and his valet Linger, who was armed with an MP-38 machine pistol. The two trailing escort cars had MG-34 machine guns mounted. The second group consisted of the minister's cars. There was one each for Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop, head of the Reich Chancellery, Dr. Hans Lammers, Heinrich Himmler of the SS and his aides and bodyguard, Dr. Dietrich, plus one vehicle reserved for invited guests, an empty reserve car in case of breakdowns, a luggage car, mobile fuel kitchen, and even a petrol tanker to ensure that so many massive gas-guzzling Mercedes didn't run dry. Further protection for the two groups of cars was provided by five motorcycle outriders mounted on BMWs who rode ahead of Hitler's group with an armed reconnaissance Hawk truck, followed by Colonel Erwin Rommel, commander of the Führer's escort, in another car, codenamed Column K, the K standing for Commandant. When Germany invaded Poland in September 1939, Hitler soon drove into the conquered territory behind his advancing armies, keen to conduct a tour of inspection of his troops and the front lines. Expecting serious trouble, the RSD and SS Beck Light Commando took no chances, and an enormous effort was made to protect Hitler's caravan of vehicles. Although it was early days in the evolution of Hitler's vehicular security, already the essential components were in place and would be instantly familiar to any American president today. The combination of the Führer Sonderzug, Hitler's personal armoured train, and the fleet of armoured Mercedes cars meant that for the Polish campaign, Hitler was able to keep moving his military headquarters. Hitler established his first Führer HQ in the East Prussian town of Bad Polsin, after Wehrmacht HQ front units had been mobilised on the 23rd of August 1939. His personal train was used, arriving at Bad Polsin station on the 4th of September. 
HQ troops and a force protection unit were drawn from the elite Grossdeutschland regiment under the command of Colonel Rommel. The Grossdeutschland traced its origins back to 1921, during the unsettled period following Germany's defeat in the First World War. The new Reichswehr was limited to only 100,000 men, and each of its divisions recruited from within a particular state. A guard regiment for the nation's capital was duly created. Wack Regiment Berlin, recruiting men from all across the nine Reichswehr divisions and in the process becoming the only true German unit in the army. Its duties were primarily ceremonial, providing sentries of the old Reich Chancellery and guards of honour for state occasions and foreign visits. Shortly after formation, the unit's name was changed to Kommando de Wachtruppe, or Guard Troop Command, and it was based at Moabit Barracks in central Berlin. When Hitler came to power in 1933, he left the unit intact, though his ceremonial guards were largely from the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, the LSSAH, under the control of Himmler. In 1934, the Kommando de Wachtruppe was renamed Wachtruppe Berlin, and a small detachment supplemented the LSSAH guards at the Reich Chancellery as well as continuing to parade and perform ceremonials throughout the capital. It was particularly visible during the 1936 Olympics. In 1937, the unit was renamed again, this time becoming Wach Regiment Berlin, with soldiers posted individually to the unit from all over Germany for six-month tours of duty. Hitler decided to change the name one last time in 1939 to reflect the national character of the regiment. Thus it became Infanterie Regiment Großdeutschland, or Infantry Regiment Greater Germany. At Bad Polzin in Poland in 1939, the Großdeutschland Regiment provided three security groups. Group 1 guarded Hitler's train and the minister's train that joined it on the 4th of September. This group also manned an outer security perimeter for 500 metres around the station. Although local people were still permitted to use the station, they were subjected to intense security scrutiny and forbidden to gather in groups. Group 2 was held as a reserve, while the front group comprised the troops who would travel with Hitler and his ministers by car. On the trip to the front in Poland in September 1939, Rommel's men provided five motorcycle outriders at the front and rear of Hitler's column, plus a signal corps platoon and an anti-aircraft platoon towing 20mm flak guns. The third and final part of Hitler's huge column trailed along five minutes behind the flak guns and was labelled Column M for Militärische or Military and consisted of a towed anti-tank gun, more cars, another anti-tank gun and elements of the signal troop, all derived from the Großdeutschland. Such a formidable array of firepower was not just a show of force, but was probably sufficient to have beaten off a determined attack by almost any group of assassins. Hitler's huge column of vehicles headed for the front at Topolno on the Vistula River. When he visited frontline units, his security was usually quite lax, to a degree that would seem almost incredible today. This was because neither Hitler nor his bodyguards believed that loyal Wehrmacht soldiers, riding high on victory, would try to kill their commander-in-chief. Only much later in the war, when the tide had turned against Germany, did Hitler become much more wary around his own men, and with good reason, as it turned out. In Poland in 1939, Hitler believed that he had nothing to fear from his generals and men. During briefings, Hitler's eight or nine bodyguards just stood about looking on, said one witness, or talking among themselves, but not, as they should have been, facing out from where Hitler was, watching the scene. This apparent break with procedure was startling, considering that Hitler was within a war zone. Any real danger in 1939 came not from fellow Germans, but from the enemy. At one point, Hitler's convoy was stopped because Polish soldiers had ambushed a field hospital unit on the road only a few minutes before. After waiting for the all-clear, the convoy drove on, meeting with another close call. The driver of an oncoming army truck was shot dead at the wheel by a Polish sniper, the vehicle smashing into one of the anti-aircraft vehicles guarding the Führer's convoy. As the convoy continued to the town of Prusesh, the Fiesler 156 Stork plane that was flying reconnaissance for Hitler's convoy was shot at by German ground troops who mistook it for being Polish. 
On arrival at Topolno, Hitler watched German troops make an assault crossing of the Vistula River before retreating to Plitnitz, where his special train was waiting to take him back to Germany after Polish planes began bombing ground targets only a mile from where Hitler was standing on the riverbank. On the 9th of September, the Führer Sonderzug and its attached HQ units moved south to Ilnan, near Opeln in Silesia. Each time the train stopped, the Großdeutschland set up a security perimeter around the station and the headquarters was connected to the local telephone exchange. The next day, Hitler paid his first visit to the Polish front by air. Shortly after 9am, six Junkers Ju-52 3M tri-motors took off from Neudorf with his large entourage and landed at Bialachow. Six Messerschmitt Bf-109 fighters escorted the Führer's aerial armada. Travelling with Hitler aboard his plane was the usual retinue. Colonel Schmundt, Adjutants Brückner, von Belo and Engel, his Dr. Brandt, Driver Kempke and his valet Linger. Two Ju-52s each carried six bodyguards, one plane consisting of SS Begleit Commando and the other RSD. The remaining three aircraft carried Keitel, Großdeutschland Front Group Commander Colonel Rommel, Colonel Bodenschatz, Hitler's Luftwaffe aide, von Ribbentrop, Bormann, Press Chief Dietrich, Schaub and personal adjutant SS Untersturmführer Max Wünscher, Himmler and their several adjutants and bodyguards. At Bialachow, Hitler met with Colonel General Walter von Reichenau, commander of the 10th Army. The cars and the other vehicles that made up the Führer's Frontgruppe were waiting to take Hitler and his large entourage to Maslow, where enthusiastic soldiers and a few German civilians mobbed him. In a major operation, Hitler's cars were driven from Germany to meet his aircraft, and this was also done throughout the war. Only the specially armoured Mercedes cars were used during Hitler's visits to the war fronts. Permitting the Führer's car to be mobbed was a serious security breach, but one which Hitler tolerated and encouraged, feeling secure in the knowledge that his beloved soldiers would not harm him. As his convoy passed through recently occupied Polish towns and villages, they were slowed to a crawl by huge numbers of soldiers, horse-drawn wagons and even trucks full of Polish prisoners of war that were being driven back from the front. Hitler's headquarters moved constantly during the Polish campaign. On the 12th of September, the Führer's train, America, arrived at Gogolin, 30 kilometres south of Opeln. On the 18th of September, it moved to Godentov Lanz, near Lauenburg, 40 kilometres northwest of Danzig. Hitler returned to his Reich Chancery aboard his train, America, on the 26th of September. Although during his battlefront tours, Hitler occasionally exposed himself to danger, particularly ambushed by cut-off enemy troops or landmines, the most serious plot to kill Hitler in Poland occurred while he was driving through the capital, Warsaw, on the 5th of October 1939. It was planned that Hitler's car would cross today's Charles de Gaulle Square in the city centre as the Führer made his way to a victory parade. Polish resistors, the cut-off remnants of Polish army units stranded in the occupied capital, planned to hide a massive improvised explosive device along the route and detonate it as Hitler's Mercedes drew level. Fortunately for Hitler, human error meant that the IED failed to explode, this plot being found out a long time after it was attempted. Throughout all the visits I've discussed, Hitler's luck held, the devil's own luck we might say. It was the devil's luck that kept him alive until 1945, dodging over 40 assassination attempts, some of which I've detailed in videos for both of my channels, so please have a look and check them out. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.